So welcome everybody to lesson six. This is where we start to take a closer look at aerobic respiration. And this is going to be the big lesson in terms of content and our uh, need to be successful with regards to aerobic respiration and, and metabolic processes at a as a whole, because a lot of the things we've learned in the past, as well as things we learned in this lesson, uh, kind of set the path for this entire unit. So I wanna make sure that we can kind of connect all these make big ideas together and develop a good understanding of aerobic respiration. So what is aerobic respiration? Again, it's that desire to consume oxygen to release energy from glucose. Now, here's where we can start to look at the individual steps of that cellular respiration with regards to oxygen utilization. And we start with looking at the first stage of aerobic respiration, that is glycolysis. So what again is glycolysis? Well, it's a chemical reaction that occurs in the cytosol, and it doesn't require those types of sophisticated organelles that the mitochondria uh, gives that cell. It's one of the oldest metabolic pathways, and it is universal for all organisms. So regardless of whether that organism has uh, a my mitochondria, it will always be persistent, it will always be a thing in all living organisms, right? Just like how all animals and all uh, eukaryotic cells go through cellular respiration utilizing a mitochondria, all cells utilize glycolysis. And the reason they utilize glycolysis is because it doesn't require oxygen. So regardless of whether it's a facultative anaerobe or a facultative aerobe or an obligate anaerobe or obligate aerobe, the cytosol is the spot where glycolysis happens for all organisms. So it's kind of neat to think about it in the context of studying aerobic respiration as a whole because the process of aerobic respiration kind of evolved as a result of glycolysis and the products that glycolysis makes. So when we take a look at the overview of glycolysis, we're going to need to start to think about what is being used and what the players are, so to speak. So the goal is to break glucose, that six carbon sugar, into two pyruvate molecules, which are three carbon hydrocarbons, as well as to make some ATP, as well as the coenzyme NADH. NADH is needed for the final stage of the electron transport chain, which is the final stage of that aerobic respiration in the mitochondrial membrane. So it's again, that idea that we are looking at tying in multiple different factors from every single lesson we've kind of learned so far to understand how this is gonna work. So when we think about that six carbon sugar, right? Glucose has that six carbon sugar with that organization, that structural organization that it has. And then we're gonna turn it into pyruvate, which is a three carbon molecule, as well as some ATP. And we're turning it into that energy carrier, that NADH, that coenzyme that we describe it as, there's a lot of things going on with regards to that first step. So just to take a look at this diagram here for a quick second, this is where we're looking at dividing things into the energy investment and the energy payoff phase. Again, I've always tried to harken back to the idea of we are going to have to spend money to make money. And, and this is one of those things that is no different because when we think about how much energy we need to put into that reaction versus how much energy we get out of it, this is where we start to see that delta G is going to be a total net sum of all the reactions, not just one step at a time, right? That quiz question that people were asking me about, how can delta G be positive or how can delta G be negative? if there are some positive and negative energy reactions within that equation. And this is where we start to look at it. So glucose, that six ring hydrocarbon here, is hydrolyzed. And it's gonna use ATP to help catalyze that reaction. So that ATP gets broken down into two ADP, as well as those phosphate groups. And we've utilized that ATP, so we've spent energy to start to hydrolyze that glucose. There's the intermediate steps in general that we'll kind of talk about as we go, but I won't spend too much time talking about it right now uh, because we have to just think about this as an energy expenditure, right? That energy expenditure to break down using hydrolysis. We then 
can take those ADPs and those phosphate groups, as well as 2NAD, that 2NAD plus, and we can look at that in terms of the energy payoff phase. So these all help to contribute to creating energy. So for every glucose molecule, for every glucose molecule, we use two ATP to start to break down that process. And as a result of that, it produces four ATP as well as two NADH and two pyruvate molecules. And we're gonna look at the specifics as we move. This is just a brief overview of the general ideas of what's gonna happen in glycolysis, okay? So back to the actual process of glycolysis, we're gonna start to look at what it actually includes in terms of the specific parts that contribute to it, as well as what those products are as a result of those specific parts. So glycolysis involves a total of 10 enzyme catalyzed reactions in two phases, okay? The energy investment and the energy payoff phase. So 10 total enzyme catalyzed reactions will take place in glycolysis, all right? So 10 total enzyme reactions, glycolysis, and it's broken down into two steps or two phases, the investment and the payoff phase. Recall now that when a cell will use energy, it's always going to be spent in the form of ATP. Now, again, I get some of you might be thinking, well, hold on, Mr. Q. I thought this whole point was supposed to be the creation of ATP. Again, you got to spend energy to make energy. It's that constant theme I'm always going to bring up in this class, specifically with regards to this unit. You got to spend some ATP to make ATP. So overall, the net reaction, the net reaction for glycolysis takes one glucose and two NAD pluses, and it creates two ATP, two NADHs, which are gonna be used for the electron, electron transport chain, as well as two pyruvate, which happens to be used in step two of pyruvate oxidation. Now, if you take note, in this chemical equation, which I don't even wanna call a chemical, equal, a chemical equation, it's a net reaction uh, equation for all of glycolysis, Recall, I don't actually say the ATP that we use, and I don't mention the extra two ATP that it's created because I cancel those two things out, right? Just like in balancing any mathematical equation, if something cancels each other out on one side of that equation, we don't have to add it, all right? So if you recall that, what I mean by that is we had to spend two ATP and it creates four ATP. The net gain or the net difference between those is just the two ATP that I have listed here. So you don't have to mention the ATP that you spend and you don't have to mention the ATP that cancels out what we spent. So this overall net reaction is what we look at for, or for glycolysis, okay? We'll look at the specific steps of glycolysis at a later date, but for now you just need to know that this is the net reaction for glycolysis. I sound like I might be harping it to bits here, but very important that we recognize the net reaction for glycolysis. Okay, that's step one. That's just glycolysis. And if you recall, that happens in the cytosol of all living organisms. Now we start to look at the specifics of cellular respiration, specifically aerobic respiration, of those spe specific species or specific organisms that have mitochondria. So when we look at pyruvate oxidation, which is the second step, we're looking at the oxidation is a, a, the redox reaction essentially, okay? Remember oxidation is the addition of oxygen and the loss of hydrogen and its electrons. So when we think about pyruvate oxidation, we really have to recall back to our understanding of those redox reactions. So pyruvate oxidation is gonna occur in that mitochondrial matrix and recall that oxidation is the addition of oxygen and the loss of hydrogen as well as its electrons. So what is pyruvate? What is its main goal? Well, we've already produced two ATP, fantastic. Now we need to utilize those pyruvate molecules that we produced in glycolysis and we need to utilize them because they do have a ton of energy still stored in those bonds, right? We only broke some bonds down of that glucose molecule 
to create those pyruvate and those NADHs to get those two ATPs as well. So now we're going to also produce some energy from those pyruvate molecules, but we also produce some compounds that are going to be needed in later steps of that uh, electron transport chain, as well as aerobic respiration as a whole. So here's where we start to look at, oops, here's where we start to look at some products that get produced as a result of waste. And if you recall, anytime we have a product that is produced that we no longer utilize, we're increasing the entropy of the universe, regardless of what happens, this CO2 specifically, that CO2 specifically is a waste byproduct. So CO2 is produced as a waste as, regard, as a result of pyruvate oxidation. NADH and hydrogen ions can be used later for electron transport chain. So again, we're looking at producing even more NADH and hydrogen ions for a later date. And then we also produce what's called acetyl coenzyme A to be used in the citric acid cycle that comes up next. So here is the general overview of that pyruvate oxidation. So first we have that pyruvate on the left-hand side. That carboxyl group is going to be chopped off, for lack of a better word. We take one big piece and we turn it into two smaller pieces. So again, that idea of entropy coming up again. That carboxyl group is lost as CO2 that waste product that we as a species, as well as many other animals and many other uh, organisms, technically quote unquote exhale. So there's an active transport protein that pulls that pyruvate from the cytosol into the mitochondrial membrane. And that's where this can start to get broken down and produced and, and to produce the NADH the hydrogen ions, as well as that acetyl coenzyme A. So this coenzyme helps, again, when we think about enzymes, it helps that substrate bind. And as a result of helping that substrate bind to an enzyme, it's lowering that activation or energy. And again, helping to preserve ATP for later. Again, we are gonna spend quite a bit of time looking at some of this stuff in more detail, but this is just a general overview of pyruvate oxidation. All right, that CO2 molecule is cleaved off of pyruvate. Active transport to, into the mitochondria from the cytosol. The production of CO2, the production of uh, NADH as well as hydrogen ions for later, and then that production of that acetyl coenzyme A, which we use in the citric acid cycle. And the acetyl coenzyme A is uh, just kind of the leftover bits of pyruvate combined with that coenzyme that we will talk more about in detail. So, so far we've gone over the two general overviews of glycolysis and pyruvate. So let's take a look in a bit more detail with regards to that pyruvate aspect, that pyruvate um, oxidation. Words lost me there for a second. So what happens in pyruvate oxidation? So the first step that we're gonna look at is something called decarboxylation. It's that carboxyl group that is removed from each of the pyru pyruvates. And recall, there are two pyruvates made for each glucose. Therefore, we're producing two carbon dioxide total for every single glucose molecule that we're looking at interacting with throughout the entire aerobic respiration process. So even though I only showed you, at, uh, showed you this diagram for one pyruvate, there's two pyruvates that were created as a result of that glycolysis reaction we saw earlier. So those two pyruvate are made from one glucose, therefore we have two CO2 produced in total. And that's through the process of decarboxylation. As you can imagine, dehydrogenation, it's, it's ref, 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 with reference to the hydrogen atoms. And so those remaining two carbon molecules of each pyruvate molecule are oxidized by the removal of hydrogen atoms, and it forms that acetyl group, that acetyl group with only two carbons. The hydrogen atoms are then transferred to NADH to form that NADH plus another hydrogen ion. Again, this is what's gonna be needed for those electron transport chains later, and that's again, where the vast majority of our ATP will be created. The third step is that production of acetyl coenzyme A. That acetyl 
coenzyme A is going to be used later in that citric acid cycle. So coenzyme A or CoA is a molecule that is added to each of those acetyl groups, that leftover carbon chain from that pyruvate. And it forms a two, it forms two acetyl-CoA molecules, right? Again, everything is done in terms of doubles. It's one glucose creates two pyruvate. So all of those reactions for that pyruvate oxidation happen twice, one for each of the pyruvates we've created from glucose. So this coenzyme A is going to help the substrate and uh, bind to an enzyme. And ultimately, it's going to lower that activation energy at a later date. So keep in mind that coenzyme A for later when we start to look at that citric acid or that Krebs cycle. So the net reaction, the net reaction of the entire pyruvate oxidation cycle per glucose, I can't stress how important enough it is to think about it in terms of the per glucose. Because again, we take one glucose, I, again, I feel like I'm going to uh, harp on it a lot, but it's so important that we recognize that we take one glucose and that one glucose gets split into two pyruvate. And then everything that happens in pyruvate oxidation needs to be doubled because it happens twice, one for each pyruvate molecule. So what we get or from that glycolysis at the start of our pyruvate oxidation is two pyruvate, two NAD plus, and two coenzyme A's. Remember that NAD plus and that coenzyme A, they get the hydrogen ions from the pyruvate and they also get attached to that uh, leftover acetyl group. So two pyruvate, two NAD plus, two coenzyme A gets turned into two acetyl CoA, two NADH plus two hydrogen ions, as well as those two carbon dioxide molecules. So digest it for 10, 20 seconds. I'm going to just let you think about it while I, I, I start to scroll onward. But every time we think about the net reaction for pyruvate oxidation, please, I cannot stress enough, it's per glucose. And again, that acetyl-CoA is going to be used in the citric acid cycle. And then that NADH, as well as those two hydrogen ions, will be for later in the electron transport chain. OK, so those are the first two stages. Stage one, glycolysis. We turn that glucose molecule into some ATP, some NADH, and some pyruvate. That's the first step. Step two, we turn those two pyruvate molecules, as well as two NAD plus and two coenzyme A's, we turn that into two acetyl coenzyme A's, two NADHs and two hydrogen ions, as well as two CO2s. If you are taking note here, no energy was produced in the pyruvate oxidation step. Not a single amount of ATP was produced. There is no production of ATP at this step. It's just producing those intermediates that we call, we call them intermediates, that two acetyl coenzyme A, the NADHs, those are all gonna be used later to make actual ATP. So now we're going to look at step three. We're halfway there, folks, halfway there. Step three, or stage three, the citric acid, or as I'll refer to it more often, the Krebs cycle. The goal of the Krebs cycle is to oxidize those acetyl coenzyme A groups, and it's going to produce ATP from that. It's also going to reduce the NAD plus as well as FAD, which are another electron carrier. Uh, all with, again, that hope of utilizing them in the electron transport chain for a later date. So as you start to see the idea of utilizing all of that glucose potential energy to not only reduce those electron carriers, but also to kind of help with regards to that oxidation, because it's, again, those intermediates that flip and change spots and allow for that electron uh, movement to produce energy. So... When we take a look at the Krebs cycle as a whole, this has eight enzyme catalyzed reactions, whereas glycolysis has 10. This one has eight enzyme catalyzed reactions. Coenzyme A or CoA, it brings that acetyl group in, right? That acetyl group is a two carbon compound. And the key thing here is that it's going to begin that citric acid cycle with that acetyl group. 
That's what that CAC is referring to the citric acid cycle. Okay. Once it brings that acetyl group in, the whole party can kind of get started. And again, it happens in the mitochondrial matrix, right? The mitochondria is for step two and step three. That's the big difference with regards to those aerobic versus anaerobics. If you don't have a mitochondrial matrix, you cannot produce or you cannot go through stage two and stage three. Uh, oxidation of pyruvate doesn't have any enzyme uh, reactions in the steps like we have in glycolysis as well as with regards to citric acid and Krebs cycle because we're not producing ATP from the pyruvate oxidation, right? Pyruvate oxidation is only to create those intermediaries to get those electrons onto those things to open up some bonds to allow for things to create energy. Those enzyme catalyzed reactions only ever happen with regards to ATP production. But we'll, we'll look at some more of that in more detail as we move from uh, stage to stage. So again, eight enzyme catalyzed reactions, so less than glycolysis. Coenzyme A is bringing in that acetyl group to start that citric acid cycle. And it's occurring all in the mitochondrial matrix. So, why do we need to understand that importance of glucose uh, in creating those two pyruvate and then those two acetyl coenzyme A's? It, it's again, it's that one molecule has now produced two, it's produced two intermediaries along the way. So we can always, always, always double up in terms of the amount of energy that is produced. And that's a good question. I'll answer that in a second. So recall one glucose molecule produces two acetyl coenzyme A's by the end of pyruvate oxidation. So again, therefore, we are always going to think about it in terms of that citric acid cycle needs to happen twice, once for each of those acetyl coenzyme A's, okay? So if it's always happening twice, we're looking at doubling up things. And so when we talk about does, does it mean less ATP is produced if enzyme catalyzed reactions is less? Yeah, I'll, I'll come back to that afterwards. That's a good question. We'll talk about that in a bit. So here is the citric acid cycle. It's simplified. You have an activity with which you can look at in your notes that I really strongly recommend you take a look at both today and over the weekend. But I will leave that to your devices. And if you have questions, we can talk about that towards the end of this lesson or this period as well as uh, next period when we have some time. So. Let's take a look at the simplified overview of the uh, citric acid cycle or Krebs cycle, and we'll kind of start to talk about some details there. So again, that pyruvate oxidation, that pyruvate oxidation has happened. We're looking at pyruvate that has been turned into that acetyl coenzyme A, as well as the NADH and the hydrogen ions, and for the later use. So once the CoA, uh, coenzyme A has helped that first reaction, it's going to be released and reused. So acetyl coenzyme A is just that intermediary that allows for that acetyl group to enter the citric acid cycle. So once it helps facilitate that reaction, the coenzyme A gets bumped back up and it's going to be reused for the pyruvate oxidation cycle for countless, countless times. I'll just clear out some stuff here. So. When we think about the citric acid cycle, I really want you to focus on the idea of it's going to produce energy. Therefore, if it's producing energy, it's going to produce waste as well. So it's going to pass through this cycle more than once. And, and what I mean by that is each time it passes through, okay, that one pyruvate molecule passes, to, passes through, it's going to produce that carbon dioxide. It's going to produce that NADH. It's going to produce the hydrogen ions. It's going to produce one ATP. And it's going to produce that FADH2, which is, again, that intermediary electron acceptor, which will be used later on. The second time it passes through is kind of neat because it's basically doubling up, right? It's basically doubling up. There's two, pyruv two pyruvate molecules. gets broken down into two acetyl coenzyme A's. And then those two acetyl groups go through the citric acid, acid cycle each once. So ultimately, you're creating two cycles for each glucose molecule. That's what this means here. Uh, I'll say it again. It's going twice through the cycle. So one glucose molecule effectively allows 
two full cycles of the citric acid cycle, simply because it split that glucose into two pyruvate, which then became two acetyl groups, which each get to go through that cycle. So ultimately the overall production, the overall production of one glucose molecule, of one glucose molecule produces four carbon dioxide in the, in the citric acid cycle, six NADH, six hydrogen ions, two ATP, and two FADH2. So again, that CO2 is a waste from the original six carbon glucose. We've now gotten rid of that last little bit of waste as a result of those final two carbons in the acetyl group being produced as waste. All of the other steps that it goes through is in an attempt to either produce energy or those electron donors. So FAD is just another electron carrier like NAD, and it's needed later in the electron transport chain. That's the, the other, it's just a different type of electron carrier. So this is the simplified, again, I stress this is the simplified version or the simplified overview of the citric acid cycle. And again, for every glucose molecule, for every glucose molecule, we're producing four carbon dioxide as waste, six NADH and six hydrogen ions, two ATP and two FADH2 for the citric acid cycle. So we've now produced some energy. We've now produced some waste. We've produced an absolute metric ton of electron carriers. And so you're thinking to yourself, okay, there's one more stage left. That's where the magic's gotta happen, right? Because if you're really keeping track, so far we've produced four ATP, right? Two ATP from the citric acid cycle and two ATP from uh, the glycolysis the first step of glycolysis. That's not a lot of energy. But the beautiful thing about all this is, is that while that glucose is being broken down, it's been able to share those electrons in all shapes and forms with those NADH and that FADH. So that starting glucose molecule has now been completely broken apart. All the carbon bonds have been broken. We've taken all six of those carbons and we've produced all, all of that carbon has now been produced into carbon dioxide. So now that carbon and oxygen atoms have all been removed and produced as that carbon dioxide waste, the hydrogen ions that are now carried by NADH and FADH2 can now be used in that electron transport chain. We're gonna talk more about that idea as we move forward, but again, recall from our last lesson in lesson four, or two lessons ago, that two electrons and one hydrogen ion are carried by NADH. We looked at that in, in that chart that we a couple of people asked questions about. So there are two electrons and one hydrogen ion for every NADH molecule. That'll be very important as we think that to how much energy is produced because when we see how the electron transport chain happens moving next, it's gonna really lend itself to our understanding of how many ATP are produced. So. As I stated earlier, stage four is the electron transport chain. And uh, also there's a step called chemiosmosis or oxidative phosphorylation, which we will uh, cover as well. Recall that only four ATP have been produced so far, right? That single glucose molecule has only produced four ATP, which is good. We can use it, that's free energy, but we haven't yet used any of those oxygens to, to form that, I guess those, that ATP molecule, right? The remainder of the potential energy that has been captured by NADH and FADH carrier molecules in that glycolysis and in that pyruvate oxidation as well as the citric acid cycle is now going to be utilized as potential energy to make ATP. So the electron transport chain occurs in the inner mitochondrial membrane, which is composed of that phospholipid bilayer as well as various proteins that are going to be very similar to the composition of the cell membrane. And this is so important. It's so important to understand this concept because when we talked about that cellular membrane and, and how it can create that electrochemical gradient, this is why we start to see how important it is because that electrochemical gradient is now going to help in our understanding of the production of ATP. 
So let's take a look at this diagram and let's start to break down the idea of ATP synthesis. So there is a larger diagram that is in the electron transport chain overview in your notes uh, that I provided. So I will encourage you to take a look at that one as well after we go over it. This is just the overview. Uh, so I wanna make sure that you have an opportunity to go over it in a bit more detail in the larger diagram. So recall, a concentration gradient is set up as a result of things moving from a low to a high concentration. Okay, from a low to a high concentration. If it's gonna happen passively, perfectly fine. It will, it will balance out, no problem, we'll reach that equilibrium. But we can't use that equilibrium, right? We can't use that equilibrium. So we need to do some active transportation out of that mitochondrial matrix to create that gradient, that electrochemical gradient for us to utilize, okay? So when we think about that utilization, we have to think about it in terms of several different steps. So there are four separate steps and four separate groups of proteins known as protein complexes. Each complex has a very specific function in accessing the potential energy stored in those energy carrying molecules and those electron carrying molecules, that FADH2 and that NADH. These proteins, can be enzymes. Uh, we won't go into too much detail about what they do specifically with regards to their enzymes. But if you see here, we have four complexes that help to facilitate the utilization of that stored energy in NADH and FADH2. So at the start of the chain, at the start of the chain, oop, the start of the chain, we have NADH and FADH2 lose their electrons and become oxidized. This is very important to think about in terms of that oxidation idea because again, when we think about those redox reactions, always, always back to the redox reactions, that NADH and FADH are seen as reactants, okay? They're the starting molecules of the electron transport chain. These carriers lose their electrons and become oxidized. Once they lose their electrons, their job's not quite finished yet, but ultimately it donates those electrons to this process in complex one. So once the electrons are moved into complex one, they get passed from the complexes along the mitochondrial matrix in what's called a chain reaction. Two electrons shuttle something that moves that electrons back and forth, they kind of help facilitate the flow of electrons through those complexes, again, through that membrane. So these electrons are going to be moved from the start where they were donated by NADH and FADH in that complex one, and then we'll talk about UQ in a second. But that complex one accepts those electrons from that NADH and FADH, and they shuttle the electrons to each of the complexes in an attempt to create that gradient. So how does that look? The first shuttle that we're gonna talk about is that ubiquinine, okay? Or UQ for short, because it's gonna be a, a pain to say ubiquinine over and over again. This is located in the inside of the inner cellular mitochondrial membrane. This transfers electrons from complexes one and two to three. So again, those first two complexes or those first complexes receive the electrons from NADH and FADH2, and then they're transferred from those complexes to complex three by that UQ. Ubiquinine also shuttles a proton into the intermembrane space when it is oxidized. Now, this is very fascinating in the sense that the shuttle protein is now moving hydrogen ions to the intermembrane space once it is oxidized, AKA receives an electron. So why is this important? Well, now we're creating that concentration gradient. As that ubiquinine moves the electron, as it becomes oxidized, it's gonna tell this cellular membrane complex to say, okay, cool, thanks for giving me that electron. Uh, as I'm oxidized, you now have the ability to pump those hydrogen ions out. So now we're creating that concentration gradient. So even though we have a low concentration gradient inside the inner membrane, because that ubiquinine is gonna be seen as that like active trans a component of the active transport protein complexes, 
it says, okay, thanks for the electron and oxidizing me, pump some hydrogen ions out. And it's gonna pump those hydrogen ions out, create that chemical imbalance, which we can utilize later. The next shuttle that we're gonna look at, the next shuttle we're gonna look at is cytochrome C or site C. This is located in the intermembrane space, again, on the side of the, inter, or the inner mitochondrial membrane. And this transfers electrons, uh, electrons from complex three to complex four. So complex four being the last complex. So it takes the electron from complex three to complex four. This is, again, the idea of the fluidity of our cellular membranes as a whole or phospholipid bilayers as a whole. This is where things really come into play here because as these shuttle proteins receive that electron, they can move freely within that fluid membrane space because it is a fluid membrane space. That mosaic membrane is fluid. It allows for the movement of proteins along it. And once it is oxidized, these shuttle molecules are oxidized, they can move electrons around that membrane space due to that fluid membrane of the mitochondria. So now we've had these electrons moved all the way from complexes one and two to three, from three to four, and throughout that entire process, there has been hydrogen ions that have been pumped out every time those electrons move across that gradient or move from complex one to complex four. So now we've created that concentration gradient, and now we can start to utilize some of that. So the electronegativity of these complexes increases along that chain going from complex one to complex three and then ultimately complex four. How do you think this property aids in the transfer of electrons down the chain? Again, when you think about the idea of electronegativity and when you think about the ability for them to attract electrons, if those complexes electronegativity is going to increase as it moves along the chain, it's just going to allow them to attract even more electrons. So as they move those electrons in one direction, they become more electronegative, which allows for them to move it in one direction only. So electrons won't flow backwards because as they continue to move, as those proteins, those shuttle proteins continue to move, they become more electronegative and they don't let the electron go backwards and flow backwards because that would ruin what happens next. So what are cofactors? Again, we're coming up to this idea of cofactors. Cofactors are found in the complexes that accept electrons. This is very important because as they become reduced, right, by upstream molecules, they're gonna then donate or become oxidized to more electronegative downstream molecules. It's gonna have that electron move from left to right in that diagram above. Again, all of this comes into important factors when we're thinking about how we move those electrons downstream, so to speak. In aerobic cellular respiration, oxygen is the final electron acceptor at the end of the electron transport chain. This is why we need to breathe. This is why people who don't get oxygen or are oxygen deprived, they start to suffer some severe side effects as a result of it because that oxygen is going to be the last step in terms of receiving that electron. It is highly, highly electronegative. When we think about each of those complexes and each of those shuttle proteins along that entire journey of that electron that was first given by NADH and FADH2, we ultimately want to end up at a molecule that is highly electronegative so it will attract those electrons. That oxygen will now then pull a pair of electrons from complex four and it also in turn reacts with that two hydrogen ions in that matrix. Remember those two hydrogen ions that NADH and FADH were a part of? It's gonna now interact with those hydrogen ions to form water. Six water molecules for every single glucose. Because this complex, number four, is less electronegative than oxygen, electrons cannot move backwards. Again, the key concept, electronegativity slowly rises between each of the complexes, each of the shuttle proteins, all the way up until complex four, which is slightly less electronegative than oxygen. So it's going to donate those electrons to oxygen. And in terms of that electronegativity, it keeps that electrons from moving backwards. So it's going to take two electrons from that complex, and it's going to 
improve upon that. It's going to get increase the electronegativity as it moves from left to right. So how do we think complex three gets its electrons back? Why do we need to even consider that? Well, again, the whole process is continuously happening inside that cell. That ubiquinin or UQ brings electrons from complex one and two. Complex three is more electronegative than UQ, so it will attract that electron. And that's why we need to consistently have that input of food, for lack of a better word, of glucose, because ultimately that electrons get replenished as a result of that breakdown of glucose. So again, when you think about moving from left to right, things always get more electronegative to attract that electron. So the last thing I want to do before I give everyone a break is go over that NADH and specifically FAD because knowing NADH has the weakest hold on electrons, how does this complex get its electrons? Haha! -ha. Again, we now start to tie it all in together. Complex one is more electronegative, so it will attract those electrons from that NADH. Enzymes help to catalyze this reaction. Remember, we talked about those eight enzyme reactions that have happened in the past, and it's going to really help even more so with regards to that electron transport chain. So then what happens to those NADH plus, or NAD pluses as well as the FADs? They get recycled. They get sent back up into that glycolysis and pyruvate oxidation reaction as well as the citric acid cycle so that entire process can begin again. Okay, folks, I'm going to stop recording here. A lot of material that we've covered so far. I want to give everyone some time to digest it, ask some questions, and in about 10, 15 minutes or so, I'm going to continue with the lesson, okay? So I'll do this in two parts.